Good morning, microbiology. So we are in chapter 12, and this is actually a really straightforward chapter. Like if you're reading through here, you should be going, yep, know that, know that. Um, because it's really all about how do we remove microbes, right? How do we control them? In particular, in chapter nine, we're talking about um, more on surfaces, right? And so we're gonna talk a lot about um, things like different chemicals that might be, right? Every time you use alcohol on the lab bench, why are we doing that? Why do we use the autoclave? Those sorts of things. In chapter 10 then, while it has a tricky name like microbial chemotherapy, it really just means like what do antibiotics do? So how do we control microbes once they're inside a person? So these two chapters are really um, closely related, which is why we're doing both of them this week. I think you'll notice a lot um, of the overlaps. So in chapter nine here, this graph is key. I think this basically explains the entire chapter. Um, and from here on out, everything else is details, All right? So we have three main ways that we can go ahead and, and get rid of or control these microbes. So we'll talk a little bit about physical um, agents, things like heat and radiation that you see on here. Let me grab a little pointer. There we go. So physical agents like heat, and radiation. Chemical agents, like we were just talking about using alcohol or some wipes, um, so different gases um, and liquids. Liquids are much more common. Um, and then mechanical removal, so things like filtration. So um, again, this should all sound really familiar to you. There is quite a bit of terminology, um, so this box down here is really good because it lays out, and you'll notice how they've kind of spread these terms throughout this graph. These really kind of lay out what is your goal, right? So disinfection is different than sterilization, right? Disinfection refers to removing the vegetative forms of microbes, right? So like just normally reproducing bacteria. Sterilization is what we're going to need to remove all viable microorganisms. That includes endospores. So that's the big distinction there. Disinfection gets rid of all the vegetative pathogens. Sterilization is what you need if you wanna take care um, of those endospores. So that would be the difference, say, between boiling um, something or, actually, that's not even a good example. Um, that's the difference between, and you talked about this in one of your labs, using alcohol on your lab bench versus autoclaving plates when you're done, right? Um, Antisepsis, this tends to, um, refer to when you're doing these same kind of te techniques, but on a body surface. So prior to surgery, for example, you would use antisepsis. You would use an iodine um, to, to clean the surgical site. That's antisepsis, right? So both disinfection and sterilization um, usually refer to inanimate objects. Um, and then decontamination or sanitization, these terms are used to talk about removing most microbes. So for us, we don't use that very often because it's not good enough in the medical field, right? We're not trying to sanitize something, we're trying to disinfect it. So you can start to see like why this terminology um, maybe is important, even though it all sounds very similar. So sanitization, for example, um, you might use in the restaurant. You know how at the bar they have like three different dunks that they put glasses through? That's sanitization or decontamination, but we're not pretending that it get rid gets rid of everything. It gets rid of enough that we're likely not spreading disease um, from person to person, um, but it is not the same as, say, disinfection or sterilization. Ah, keep that in mind next time uh, you go to a bar. Okay, so then, right, this, so this chart really is, um, uh, the best, I don't know, review, the best model of everything we're talking about, right? As we can see like, okay, well, what if we wanna use a physical agent to, to sanitize something or a, a chemical agent to disinfect something? You can come back to this graph and see it all. So um, one of the things we need to keep in mind, right, is we have a variety of microbes. We've been talking about this so far this semester, a variety of different microbes that we might want to be killing, right? Those are what we're, what we're after here. Um, and so we need to keep in mind that if we want to remove or destroy 
excuse me, different kinds of microbes. Um, some are more resistant to death than others, right? So I thought this was a really nice image. Um, the most resistant to destruction are going to be the prions. And if you remember prions, those are the infectious proteins. They're already denatured. They're already misshapen. And so there's like nothing you can do for prions. What are you going to do? Heat them up, cook them, try to denature them. They're already denatured. And this has proven really problematic. So um, they've actually had some cases where prion diseases have spread person to person um, through surgical equipment, because even though it goes through this normal, you know, autoclave process that really should, that does sterilize the equipment, those prions aren't alive, right? And so they're not getting killed. And so those stick around. Okay, but those are the oddballs, not particularly common. Um, from there, right, of course, bacterial endospores, we said those are the hardiest of all life forms. And so it makes sense. They are the hardest um, to destroy. Um, I won't go through all of these, but um, mycobacterium, they're difficult. So this would be like the genus that causes tuberculosis. They're pretty difficult to remove um, because they have a kind of a unique cell wall. They don't have this normal, they're not gram positive or gram negative. Um, and so they're a little more difficult to destroy. Okay, and then we start moving down through here, uh, different bacteria. Remember, cysts are going to be more difficult to kill uh, than trophozoites, the more like the vegetative form of a protozoan. Um, then we see gram-negative bacteria, fungi, and fungal spores. Remember, fungal spores are just reproductive structures. They're not the same as an endospore. Um, here's our gram positive, right? So one thing you might notice is that gram negatives are more difficult to kill um, than gram positive, and that kind of makes sense, right? We've got an outer membrane up here that might be protecting us, um, say, from a, you know, alcohol or, or some other chemical. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out, notice the difference in enveloped, sorry, non-enveloped and enveloped viruses. First, you should note that viruses are relatively easy to kill right, compared to everything else. And so particularly given COVID-19, that can be reassuring, right, that viruses are easy to kill. Um, and enveloped viruses, in fact, are the easiest thing to kill, which of course, SARS-CoV-2 is an enveloped virus, right? So the, the, it's taken that um, phospholipid bilayer from its host cell, um, but that actually ends up being a weakness because we have all sorts of things that, are, that can easily destroy um, a phospholipid bilayer. Right? Even a gram-positive bacteria has a layer of peptidoglycan um, outside of that to protect um, the inner workings. Okay, so again, you don't have to say, like, memorize this whole scale, but you definitely want to have in your mind, okay, bacterial endospores, super difficult to kill, right? Maybe gram-negatives are harder to kill than gram-negatives. Uh, Non-enveloped viruses are harder to kill than enveloped viruses, right? Those sorts of things. Tuck, tuck this away into your memory. Okay, and again, just a reminder, um, so this is pointing out the difference between endospores and how hardy they are compared to the vegetative um, form. So notice, right, endospores 1.5 times more resistant um, to moist heat. Uh, that's, that's less like steam in an autoclave. 43 times more resist, resistant to radiation. Doesn't mean you can't kill them with radiation, but you're gonna have to think about your dosage um, there. Some different gases, um, and there's a um, glutaraldehyde that would, that's a pretty gnarly chemical that you could use to kill bacteria, but apparently not endospores. Okay, so all of this becomes important, particularly working in a healthcare care setting. Um, a couple other things to kind of keep in mind here. Um, this is trying to show um, how effective or why certain things um, are effective, right? If we are trying to kill a microbe, right? Um, your book defines microbial death as the, quote, termination of an organism's vital processes, okay? Or um, the permanent loss of reproductive capability, even under optimum conditions. So the thing we have to keep in mind here in microbial death, right, is if you put bacteria in the freezer, right, they aren't metabolizing, they aren't reproducing, but they're also not dead. If you return them to optimal growth conditions, lots of them are going to pop right back up and start doing their things. So here's a life application, right? You buy that manager's special chicken at Natty G, right? And you're like, I'm going to make it tonight. 
right? Because today is the expiration day and then it doesn't happen. And you go, I better shove this in the freezer. I'm not going to have time. Okay. When you pull it out of the freezer a week or a month, whatever later, you got to use it that day, right? You're not just going to thaw it and then five days later use it because as soon as it thaws, those microbes that were there, when you put it in the freezer, are right there ready to reproduce. Okay. So microbial death, permanent loss of reproductive capability, even under optimum conditions. Okay. Um, so if you cook the chicken, you will have cooked all the microbes. Now you can put it in the freezer and your timer starts all over when you thaw it. Okay. There you go. Liberal arts education. What are we learning? Um, I will also say, do you remember our microbial growth curve, right? We had like the lag, the log, the stationary phase, and then the um, death phase. Keep in mind that those younger microbes, they're more metabolically active. Those actually die easier. I think we mentioned this when we talked about that growth curve. Um, then the older microbes who are growing really slowly, um, maybe in that stationary phase, those can actually be pretty challenging, more challenging anyway, um, to kill off. Okay. So maybe it's not as straightforward as just like, okay, what is the organism, but also where it is in that growth curve. Okay, so then if you think about the effectiveness of our various tools, whether that's an autoclave or a chemical, um, a couple things to, to point out here, right, is what this first chart is showing you um, is the number of viable cells. And basically what, what we're indicating here is if you have a really high, what we would call like a high microbial load, it is going to um, take longer. It is going to be more difficult um, to kill things off, right? So if you only had a few bacteria in this flask, right, it really only might take two minutes in the autoclave to kill it. But if you have a huge number of bacteria, it can take longer to get there. And so typically I run the autoclave for 15 minutes, right, to make sure we get to sterilized um, regardless of how many microbes are in there. Um, we already mentioned that what specific organism it is can make a difference um, in how effective the uh, agent of death is. Um, and oftentimes, particularly with like patient samples, um, you're looking at a, a mixture of those sorts of things. Um, other things that can make a difference, we already talked about this difference between spores and vegetative cells. So again, in the autoclave, those vegetative cells are dying really quickly. Um, the spores are going to take much longer. Um, we're pointing out here whether it is microbiostatic or microbiocidal. And so this is a, a good point here. Notice, so microbiostatic agents, notice how it's not changing the number of viable cells. We're not actually with microbiostatic, it's like sta stasis, like stop. You can stop the growth with those chemicals, but it doesn't actually kill the microbes. Microbiocidal, right? Think the the cidal ending, like homicide or suicide or um, infanticide, like any of those, right? It means death. And so an agent that is microbiocidal is actually killing the microbe, not just keeping it um, from reproducing. So you might look, start paying attention to labels on like cleaning products and stuff um, that you buy. Um, another thing, I guess it's not showing on here. Um, another thing that can really make a difference that might be important for you guys is the, the presence of other materials. So for example, particularly I think of the presence of organic matter. So you go to sterilize, say, um, colonoscopy equipment. There might be some organic matter present. Um, the typical procedure actually has you like cleaning it before sterilizing it because the presence of that material can actually make it take longer um, than expected, say, for an autoclave um, to clean that product. Same thing with surgical equipment, right? If there's blood, that's organic matter. And so typically that would actually get cleaned off um, before going through sterilization. Okay, so all these are things that you might consider um, when you're trying to decide, okay, what gets rid of the pathogens that I'm interested in here? Um, and will it harm the tool? Will it harm the patient um, that I'm treating? And so you've got a few different factors to consider um, when choosing how you are going to get rid of these pathogens. Okay, and so what we're gonna look at here is that we really have 
um, four main targets that we can use when we're when we're taking um, a physical or chemical agent to try to kill um, our microbes here. So we can target the cell wall, the cell membrane. Um, synthesis within the cell. So typically here we're talking about DNA synthesis or RNA synthesis. Um, and then the proteins in themselves, right? Their structure or their function. So typically under cellular synthesis, we talk about, um, you know, you could interfere with, say, transcription so that you can't produce a protein. But now down here, we're actually dealing with the true finished product, right? And altering the structure or function of that protein. So this is what we're going to run through in this video, these various um, targets. Okay, so here's our cell wall, remembering our dif difference between gram positive um, and gram negative. Hopefully we're there. Hopefully we're, we've got this memorized. We're not, never going to forget it. Um, and so for chemical controls to work on the cell wall, we're trying to do things like either block the synthesis of the cell wall in the first place, right? That, mm, that peptidoglycan, remember it was like that cross linking of all these sugar protein um, molecules. So we could block the synthesis, which that would be really important, say in like that, or that would be effective at killing cells that are in the process of undergoing division because they have to build new cell walls. Um, we might look for chemicals that can actually digest um, peptidoglycan, breaking it down. Um, because again, once this is broken, remember this was one of the big protections for bacteria against osmotic stress, right? It keeps the cells from exploding because it acts as that kind of outer um, limiter on cell expansion. So once we can damage the cell wall, the cell becomes much more fragile. It's easy to lyse it. And so this is what we're going to do. We'll talk about it in chapter 10, something like penicillin. That's how it breaks down the cell wall. But for here, if you're thinking about cleaning um, surfaces, that's what detergents do. Um, and alcohols are actually really effective um, at this as well, breaking down, um, interfering with the cell wall. The cell membrane, right? Remember, we have this selectively permeable phospholipid bilayer. So um, as soon as you damage it, right? And the cell can no longer control what's going in and out. That is going to lead to the death of the cell. Um, so this picture is showing us the activity of a, uh, a chemical called a surfactant. So surfactants are polar molecules. So they look an awful lot like a phospholipid, which is also polar. Um, and they manage to bind to the membrane, um, penetrate into that internal um, hydrophobic region, and basically start ripping it apart, poking holes um, in there. And so now the cell is going to leak and the cell is going to lyse. This is something that alcohol does, right? It dissolves those membrane lipids. Um, and this is an alcohol that's at a concentration higher than 50%. And so this is actually really um, important, right? So when we use bleach, totally different chemical, we usually use a very low dilution. Something like 10% bleach can be really effective at killing bacteria. Alcohol in order for it to act on the cell membrane, it has to be above 50%. So you might notice that the spray bottles in the lab actually say 70% alcohol. Don't So you don't want to mix that up. If you make a 10% alcohol solution, it's not going to do anything. Okay. Um, other chemicals that affect um, the cell membrane, there's a group of chemicals called the phenols. The one that you would recognize there um, is probably lysol. That's, that fits into the phenol class. Another one is triclosan. That's the antibiotic that they put in hand soap a lot, right? So both of those chemicals um, are acting on the cell membrane. Um, and then chlorhexidine, which again, if you're already working in the field, you've heard of it, but maybe you haven't heard it called chlorhexidine. You've heard it called hibiclens, right? So hibiclens, um, is really effective against things like MRSA. And so it's become a really common antisepsis. Um, you give it to people to, to bathe with, say, the day before or the day of um, a surgery, right? So all of those, the alcohols, the phenols, um, chlorhexidine, these are all acting on the cell membrane. Okay, so then we have some other components that, again, this kind of goes into that cellular synthesis that was in the list, right? The synthesis of nucleic acids, so that would be DNA replication, or um, protein synthesis, particularly um, thinking about transcription, taking DNA and making RNA. Um, I guess, and the translation portion as well. We have chemicals that can interfere 
um, and stop translation, right? Typically those are going to bind to the ribosome and prevent the formation um, of those peptide bonds, the formation of a polypeptide, okay? So we can interfere uh, with the production um, of proteins. As far as the nucleic acid side goes, um, we can actually damage these nucleic acids. We can cause mutations. And remember, our bacteria are dividing really rapidly. So we figure, well, if we cause some mutations, uh, it's going to be more of a problem to the bacteria, um, particularly, again, on surfaces. So we're, we're causing mutations, this permanent um, inactivation of DNA. We would use things like radiation to do that. Um, we would use really gnarly chemicals like formaldehyde to do that. Um, and then you could also use free radicals. Right, remember free radicals can be damaging to DNA. So there you go, something even like hydrogen peroxide could be causing enough damage um, to mess up cellular synthesis. Okay, and then finally our fourth target was that protein structure and function. So these proteins that are already built, how can we go ahead and denature them? And so I really liked this picture. Notice how detailed um, the folding, particularly that tertiary, do you remember this? You have a primary structure of protein, that's the polypeptide chain, and then it starts folding. You have a secondary structure. It's either um, an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet. And then the tertiary structure means that all of those components kind of, again, fold over on each other. And it's not magic. It's hydrogen bonding. It's sulfur bonding. It's attraction between different amino acids that were put into that polypeptide chain. Anyway, Notice how detailed this is. See how like, okay, there's this perfect shape right here where this substrate can fit. So if, for example, this protein is an enzyme, remember that like lock and key mechanism? That active site has a very, very precise shape. So notice what happens if you use heat or pH, you can denature the protein. That I mean, that one's completely gone. There's no active site. But even a slight change here, right, that's not going to be quite the right shape. Or look at the, the shape over here. That kind of closed in. This protein is no longer going to function. Um, and then we have some chemicals where we might actually be binding to that active site, and it's going to be blocked. It no longer functions, right? So we have a, a variety of different ways that we can interfere with um, this protein protein's function. So um, the classic examples uh, they point out are heat. Um, again, you, when you fry an egg, the albumin, the white, starts out clear and then it denatures and it actually turns that white or that opaque. Okay, um, so coagulation by heat. We can use a variety of organic solvents to cause denaturation of proteins. Again, alcohols, in this case, um, the alcohol, again, has to be very concentrated, somewhere between 50 and 95% alcohol. It turns out 100% alcohol actually won't denature proteins. There needs to be a little bit of water in order for alcohol to work. So 100% alcohol isn't an effective agent either, which is, again, why we chose 70%. So it's going to work both on that cell membrane and also as far as denaturing proteins. Um, acids can also be really effective at that. Um, the, as far as blocking the active site, typically those might be metallic ions. So you could use, say, something like aluminum potentially to act uh, to denature, not to denature, sorry, but to stop the function of proteins by blocking active sites. Um, chlorine, iodine, those are going to break sulfide bonds. And again, sulfide bonds help give us the tertiary structure. So chlorine and iodine can act against the structure and function of proteins. Um, and then chlorhexidine again, the hibiclens, can also act on proteins. So a few of these you'll notice actually cross categories, um, and they can be effective in multiple different ways. Okay. So let's break down this chart just a little bit here, and let's take a, a minute to focus in here um, on physical agents. So something I do want to point out, notice here they're talking about heat. So heat is microbiocidal, right? We're actually looking at trying to say denature the proteins. Cold is microbiostatic, like we were talking about with the freezer. You can slow, you can stop the growth 
but as soon as it returns to optimum conditions, that microbe will continue to grow and reproduce. Okay, so under heat then we have two main categories, dry heat and moist heat. Um, so this moist heat, typically we're talking about um, things like boiling water, um, hot water, steam, etc. Notice that um, moist heat actually takes way less time to kill microbes at a given temperature. So 121 Celsius, that is above boiling. If you use moist heat, it takes 15 minutes to sterilize, right? Completely kill everything, including endospores. But notice the dry heat. You would have to put it in dry heat. That would be like an oven for 600 minutes for 10 hours before um, that becomes sterilized. Okay, so under dry heat, we think about um, some sort of oven or <clears throat> an open flame. Um, so the thing to keep in mind here, right, is you look at that and you go, oh, moist heat is way more effective. And that is a big portion of why we use um, something like an, an autoclave, right? So boiling is a quick way um, to do disinfection, not true sterilization. Um, in the lab, we use the autoclave so that I can put things in at 121 degrees Celsius for 15 minutes and be done, right? It doesn't have to take 10 hours. So a lot of times you go, oh, well, moist heat is more effective. Yes, but what you do in lab is using dry heat. But your loop only stays in the flame for, you know, a matter of seconds. Doesn't that seem ineffective? How hot is that Bunsen burner? Look at this, 6,500 degrees Celsius. Okay, nothing is surviving that. And so you get almost instantaneous death of microbes, right? In fact, sometimes if you've picked up enough, you can hear them, you hear their little screams, the, the sputtering um, as that chunk of bacteria is really getting incinerated. It's turning into ash. Um, that is death right there, right? No questions about it. Um, but again, it's really common in the medical setting. Um, I use this in the lab, the autoclave. Again, we have high temperatures, but we also have pressure and we have steam. And so we're forcing that steam inside of uh, the endospores and killing them that way fairly quickly. I also wanted to point out, um, so boiling, um, again, really good just for, for disinfection. Keep in mind, right, this should be at 100 degrees Celsius. And so here at altitude, water actually boils at a lower temperature. Um, and so if you are trying to use this for disinfection, say um, in the back country, trying to boil some water to drink, you should let it be a rolling boil um, for a few minutes there um, because it's actually not at 100 degrees Celsius. Um, another technique here that you've heard of, pasteurization. So pasteurization is going to be a heating but notice what happens here. It's a lower heat. So 71 degrees Celsius, that's still hot, but it's not boiling and it's very quick. So 15 uh, seconds. So what you're trying to do here is kill the, the microbes that could potentially lead to illness, right? The pathogens, but you're not gonna kill everything. So think about pasteurized milk. You still have, say, lactobacillus species in there, but ideally you're not going to get like botulism from your milk. Okay, and so that's what pasteurization, um, it's the idea is it's less likely to change things like the nutrients in that uh, food or beverage. It's less likely to change um, the flavor. Okay, and so what you have in there will spoil eventually. So you can see this again, this example of milk. Have you seen that Tetra Pak milk? So like most milk is obviously refrigerated, but you go down the baking aisle and you can get milk that's actually been um, heated more so that there's no microbes, right? It's shelf stable um, and it's not going to go bad like the milk in the, in the cooler case will. Okay, again, um, incineration for uh, dry heat there. Whoop. Um, Oh, okay, so the other half of physical control, another major physical control method um, is radiation. And what we're looking at here is really, and this gets 
super into physics, right? But with radiation, we're looking at the energy emitted um, from atomic activities, right? So from the atoms um, that are dispersed at really high velocities through matter and space. And so here we go, gamma rays, x-rays, cathode rays, um, these are forms called ionizing radiation, and the idea here is that they're going to lead to uh, mutations in the DNA. So they're trying to show the ionizing radiation, it can penetrate through things to a deeper level, uh, you know, into cells to the point where it can actually damage um, DNA. So this will get used on things like, um, here's our example, um, using ionizing radiation on food. Um, any food that's been exposed to this radiation should have this little symbol called the radura. But the idea here is that those raspberries that have been irradiated, we were able to damage the DNA of, say, a fungus, right? There might have been a little fungal spore that landed on those raspberries. This is so sad when it happens, right? Like, you paid money, good money usually, for those delicious looking raspberries, and like the next day, they're super moldy. So, using ionizing radiation is a way to keep that food um, good longer. I don't see this symbol a lot. I think there was a lot of consumer mistrust of this technology. The rate, so that the raspberries are not radioactive, right? They've been treated with radiation. We've damaged the DNA, um, but that's not going to damage your DNA. Okay, so there was a lot of consumer mistrust. I don't see this technology used a lot, um, but it's actually pretty clever, right? You don't have to use heat, so you're not damaging the flavor. You're not damaging um, the nutrients. But some people didn't like it. Um, sorry, and I skipped past this. Just a quick reminder, if you don't remember, um, the visible light spectrum, UV radiation um, <clears throat> is slightly off the visible spectrum. Gamma rays, x-rays, what we were talking about in ionizing radiation, it has really short wavelengths, so it has penetrating power. So UV radiation can also be used and that's going to be this non-ionizing radiation. It, it's not as strong, right? It can't actually penetrate. So then what you're trying to do, whatever you're trying to treat, needs to be directly exposed. So you'll actually see this done in water treatment. And notice what happens here, right? It, it can't penetrate cells, so it has to be in direct contact here in order to um, cause this mutation of the bond. And what we see happening here, what what typically caused by UV radiation is what's called a, a thymine dimer. So when there's two thymines next to each other, um, the UV radiation can kind of fuse those, but now they're not going to work properly. So it's going to be difficult to say, make copies um, of DNA, right? To do DNA replication or to do transcription. Um, and so here's that example of using UV radiation to treat water. You may have seen this um, in backpacking too. You can now buy a UV light that you put into your Nalgene bottle, right? And swirl it around and um, disinfect your water that way. So pretty clever. Okay, so then um, filtration, right? This is another great way. This is a mechanical means um, of removing microbes. And <clears throat> here's an example. Again, you could use this in backpacking. If you have one of those little filters and you sit there by the stream, what you're trying to do is you have a filter with very small pores so that water can fit through the pores, but then your microbes are left on the outside, right? And so that's why you're having to exert so much pressure on that filter is you have really small pores and you need the power in order to use that. So you can set these up in your home as well, a little bit easier um, to do that kind of filtration. As far as, the one thing to keep in mind there, though, is that doesn't necessarily remove, say, toxins, right, or heavy metals. So particularly in the de desert southwest, you should be really careful um, filtering water supplies where there might be, say, arsenic in a spring. That's not going to come out with a filter. The filter is really meant to take care of microbes. Other filters, um, keep in mind in the hospital setting, you might see air filters that are much better than other places. And this has become, again, a big thing with COVID, COVID <clears throat> having HEPA filters, these high efficiency particulate air filters, HEPA, high efficiency particulate air filters, um, because those are going to uh, actually clean the air, right? Not just take, say, dust out of it. And so often they'll have HEPA filters, say, in um, in the air handling systems of, a, say, a surgical 
site. I think we're going to start to see a lot more of these as we realize um, kind of the things that are being spread and circulated might be kind of nice to say having a classroom office building. Okay. Um, and then the chemical controls, we already talked about this an awful lot, but I did want to point out, again, these tables don't memorize the whole thing, but we can talk about, you know, how bleach is able to do things like denature enzymes. So this is kind of the opposite. We were looking at the, the targets and then kind of saying, okay, what all fits in here? And now this is as a list that's taking you through temp chemical controls, um, and you can see what causes what. There's our iodine. Um, we're breaking up proteins again, right? We're able to denature. We talked about how hydrogen peroxide can form free radicals, right? That might damage DNA. And so I won't read the whole chart, um, but again, kind of thinking about this in the opposite direction. And so all of this, right, kind of comes back to here, okay? Again, go back through this terminology, make sure you're comfortable with that and that you have an idea of, of kind of what these different tools are that we have at our disposal as far as controlling the growth of microbes. Again, this is really about inanimate objects, surfaces, you know, water that you want to drink, that sort of thing. Um, and then we'll jump into chapter 10, which has to do more with how we're going to treat patients with antibiotics. Okay, we'll see you for chapter 10 here in just a minute.